So, uh, my name is Greg Fisher, and I am a student at Trinity Seminary. Um, I have uh, about 52 years of ordained Christian ministry and my background, and uh, kind of a starry-eyed idealist that has now become a curmudgeon. And I hold strong opinions on just about everything, I suppose, especially if it has to do with missions and evangelism. So we're going to talk about uh, the connection of evangelism and apologetics, which uh, was the theme of one of the classes that we did, and discuss it in terms of something that I call um, actualized apologetics. Now, right from New Testament times, um, you can see that uh, the defense of the Christian gospel was never disconnected from evangelism. Evangelism was taking place and it would be taking place within the, within the context of defense of the gospel. Um, Luke and Acts make this abundantly clear. Uh, we have Peter on the day of Pentecost, uh, who stands up to make a defense of the Christians who were receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and saying, these are not drunk as you're supposing, but uh, this is that which was sp spoken by the prophet Joel. And then Peter goes on to lay out a, a fairly well organized defense at, with the final call, the call to action being repent and be baptized every one of you. So um, other times uh, that would be a good example would be uh, Paul before Agrippa making his defense not only of himself but of the faith that he is preaching, uh, the Christian faith uh, before Agrippa. And Agrippa, towards the end of the, uh, towards the end of this presentation, is looking at Paul and says, "What? You expect me to become a Christian?" Well, obviously, in his defense, there was also an evangelistic element. And then, uh, if we take a look at Paul's whole focus of mission, he said it was testifying to both to the Jews and the Greeks of repentance towards God and faith uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the early church fathers continued with this connection. Apologetics evangelism. Justin Martyr uh, presents Christianity <coughs> as a morally superior religion using John's <clears throat> dualism. Um, John, writing the gospel and the, uh, and the epistles, uh, took a huge risk, especially in the face of incipient uh, Gnosticism at the time, and uh, used a a, a Greek idea of the dualism. You are from your father. I'm, I'm from my father in heaven. You are of your father, the devil. Uh, contrasting light and dark and up and down. Um, so many of these uh, dual uh, comparisons are made in the Johannine uh, literature. And Justin Martyr has picked up on that, and as a former student of Plato, as a former follower of Plato's thought, um, he trashes that and says, no, wait, this is even more superior to what Plato 
uh, was talking about. In fact, if Plato has any uh, any value, any truth in him, he plagiarized it from Moses. Origen uh, wrote an, apolo po uh, an apologetic against uh, Greek polytheism because this is the arena they were in. They were defending the faith against uh, polytheism and always with a view that people should come to be saved, that they should come into the kingdom of God. Eusebius defended Origen's apologetic and he wrote about eight or nine apologetic works against Greek polytheism, uh, many of which exist even to today that we can read and, and learn from. Of this period, John Warwick Montgomery notes, uh, the biblical apologetic focuses in four areas, and these are subsequently employed throughout human history. Miracle, fulfilled prophecy, natural revelation, and personal experience. What the philosophers term subjective immediacy. But a great disconnect came uh, towards the end of this early Christian period. And it was certainly uh, happening at the same time as Rome uh, was falling into complete disarray and then finally falling as an empire. And the great disconnect was starting right in there. Now, before Rome fell, there was a great deal of literacy in Rome. Now, that's not to say that people were able, that a large number of people were able to read classic uh, uh Latin or or the classic Greek, but the people had literacy at another level. It's kind of a level that we see sometimes today, and that was they there there were pigeon uh, there were pigeon languages that of uh, of Latin. There was Koine Greek, the common Greek. And um, people would have a smattering of all of that, and they'd be able to read, and they'd be able to write, and effectively communicate in, um, in that medium um, before Rome fell. It was widespread. Um, you remember in Rome um, and in Pompeii, uh, the walls were covered with graffiti. What good is graffiti if nobody can read? And the people putting it there didn't write in real polished Latin or Greek. Um, they they were writing in one of these pigeon. Uh, they were writing one of these pigeon languages. Uh, after Rome fell, uh, literacy rates began to drop rapidly, and that made access to the scriptures and to Christian writing difficult, if not impossible. Uh, literacy then became the domain of specially trained scribes uh, who had the secret of writing and reading, and most people now do not. And with that, also, theology and apologetics moved from the pulpit into the monasteries. And we see the beginning of the great disconnect between apologetics and evangelism. Um, included this little chart. You can see <coughs> that one of the effects of the fall of Rome, Western Roman Empire was literacy rates drop dramatically. And most uh, Greek Roman uh, learning was forgotten. And in addition, as I was saying before, the languages began to change. Now, remember, these are all languages of wider communication. Um, 
and they begin to change. Latin begin to uh, soften and become Spanish and Italian and French. And uh, now there was no unifying language uh, for all of Europe. A second reason that there was this great disconnect was the rise of Christendom. Um, <clears throat> Jesus spoke often about the kingdom of God and the nearness of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. Christendom, after uh, Constantine, Christendom became an amalgamation of Christianity and Roman <clears throat> politics. Malcolm Muggeridge says, the founder of Christianity was Christ, whereas the founder of Christendom was Constantine. Therefore, it is not Christ's Christianity, which is uh, floundering in a sea of materialism, but the Christendom already condemned by Jesus when he announced his kingdom was not of this world. And Muggeridge uh, holds that the church is already polluted by the world because we've been seeking popularity in the world. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, Thomas John Curry, who is the Roman Catholic Auxiliary Bishop of Los Angeles, uh, wrote, Christendom is a system dating from the 4th century by which governments upheld <coughs> and promoted Christianity. And Christendom failed when governments no longer upheld Christian values or promoted the church. But this fusion of Christianity with national politics has continued uh, down through history with uh, devastating effects on both the church and the public at, at large. And we even see it today in our culture with the fusion of church and national politics with the rise of uh, the Christian nationalism in the United States. In, all of these ideas about the church and the kingdom of God, the church, the kingdom of God, the church began to see the kingdom of God as being the political power, which it never was intended to do. So for the Roman Catholics, the church and the kingdom are one and the same. If you were a dispensationalist Protestant, um, the church is where we're living now in the church age, and the kingdom is for something in the future that will happen um, after Christ returns. If you are a <coughs> post-millennial, uh, then you would see that uh, this is an eschatology of some kind of hope and that we would be ushering in the kingdom of God. Uh, the church would be ushering in the kingdom of God through the use of political power and justice and reforms uh, that would come and the kingdom would be ushered in in that way. But all of those arguments have some problems to them. I like how George Eldon Ladd sums up this whole issue of the church and the kingdom of God, because that's what got confused with the rise of Christendom. And Ladd says, in summary, there is an inseparable relationship between the kingdom and the church. They're not to be identified. The kingdom takes its point of departure from God, the church from human beings. The kingdom is God's reign and the realm in which the blessings of his reign are experienced. The church is the fellowship of those who have experienced God's reign and entered into the enjoyment 
of its blessings. The kingdom of God creates the church, works through the church, <clears throat> and is proclaimed in the world by the church. There can be no kingdom without a church, those who have acknowledged God's rule, and there can be no church without a kingdom, but they remain two distinguishable concepts, the rule of God and the fellowship of men and women. So uh, moving towards a solution, how do we bring all of this together? Uh, how do we rejoin apologetics and evangelism? They should have never been divorced in the first place. How do we rejoin them? Braxton Hunter, in his book, <coughs> Evangelistic Apologetics, um, has some great observations that he makes about how to bring uh, back and reconnect. And one of the things that he suggests is that we should train lay apologists using a facilitator and that the apologetic methodologies should be tailored for specific audiences. <coughs> But here's the problem. Any church leader knows the discouragement of training people for a task which doesn't produce the desired result. And then the apologetics is not actualized. So the solution to all of this starts with asking the right questions. What do we want our students to know? What do we want our students to be able to do? And how will the training impact the student's spiritual life and develop a heart for evangelism and apologetics? <coughs> Braxton Hunter tells us, connecting of dots is really all that the careful facilitator needs to accomplish. Now that would require the facilitator or the curriculum writer to reduce complex uh, apologetics arguments into more uh, of a straightforward form that would be easy for the students to learn and use. This is an approach that engages the head, the intellect, and uh, targeting the intellect in our apologetics training is pretty pretty common. In fact, I'm thinking that it might be almost uh, a kind of an exclusive. <coughs> um, Norman Giesler writes, our missionaries have not been trained in apologetics. Our missionaries do not know how to pre-evangelize. They do not know how to get somebody out of a pantheistic worldview into a theistic worldview because the gospel is a theistic message. It doesn't make any sense in a pantheistic universe, and it certainly does not make any sense in an atheistic universe. <laughs> now that sounds really good when we when we're when we're reading that and but if you listen carefully you hear echoes of the scholasticism that was a part of the great disconnect in the first place the missionary task is not one of getting somebody out of a pantheistic worldview to bring them into a theistic worldview it is the task of taking God's message and expressing it so that it will have impact in any worldview. So a careful listener to get Geisler's approach will hear the faint echoes of scholasticism that began with the great disconnect. <coughs> Here's an important point to remember. The head will not go where the heart has not been.
The head will not go where the heart has not been. So what I'm proposing is that uh, in, in, in the training where we want to see now the reconnection of evangelism and apologetics is that we pay attention <coughs> to three uh, different domains of learning. This comes from Bloom, Bloom's uh, three uh, domains and the taxonomy. And the three domains would be the cognitive, that's the head, the affective, that's the heart, and the psychomotor, that's the hands. All three of these domains have to be in, in focus for there to be a good understanding and outcome of our training. Now, the heart domain, remember the important point was the head will not go where the heart is not gone. Norman Geisler says, I, I was at Soledad Church in San Diego some time ago and asked the pastor what he wanted me to preach. He said, well, I'm embarrassed to say. I would like to say, just get up and give an expositional message, but my people don't even believe in truth. Now that's a harsh statement. <coughs> And it's a heart statement about the heart domain of the people in the congregation. Because people who have not internalized the objective truth of God's revelation are Christians at name only. And any training that we do with them is going to be unfruitful. And remember, Paul uh, tells us the, we for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. They're strong, pulling down uh, uh, imaginations, pulling down things that are uh, challenging uh, uh, God's uh, truth and taking every thought captive. But Christians who are Christians in name only have no weapons of spiritual warfare with which to do to destroy uh, arguments. <coughs> the hand domain, the psychomotor, is the most often ignored domain when we begin to do Christian training. So what happens is where we don't have the to do in focus, we're creating students that are passionate about God and his word who willingly study the word of God but can't do anything productive with it. <clears throat> Let me give an example. Um, in my early years, um, my, I was in my 20s, uh, my dad owned a barber college. He was a barber by trade. And he owned a barber college. I learned to be a barber. And this is an example of the focus on the hand domain. Dad would show us how to start the haircut. He was really big about the neckline. So you started there. And you got a good neckline put in. Then you moved on to other areas uh, to continue the <coughs> haircut. But that's what you learned at first. And so a subject would get into your chair. And you would start out uh, trying to give a haircut at, with an emphasis on that neckline that dad felt was so, was so important. And then when you were done... Uh, he would come over and show you how to fix all the problems that you caused uh, in the haircut so that the guy could actually leave and, and look like something. And eventually what happens is you uh, learn the various uh, you learn the various techniques and you learn the various methodologies here got to do this. Here's how you do the sides. Here's how you 
uh, 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 shorten the top. Here's how you make an outline around the ears and down the neck. And here's how you, uh, and you're learning those things. And eventually, <coughs> you learn uh, by rote how to produce an excellent haircut. And you can actually do that fairly well most of the time. But then eventually you move from that part into being able to um, uh, handle unusual problems that present themselves and, and use all of your, what you've learned and all of your skill uh, to create uh, new solutions to problems that you hadn't run into before. And now you're on the way to really being a, 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 a excellent barber. And finally, <coughs> in the last step, <coughs> in the last step, you become, uh, it becomes uh, just a part of you. Uh, even today, I'm 76 years old. 50 years ago, uh, my dad taught me how to cut hair, and I, I, I cut hair off and on all my, all my adult life. But even at age 76, I cut my uh, grandson's hair because they like how I do it. That is the hand domain, and this is where the doing happens. Now, how does that translate into evangelistic apologetics? I like something that Dr. Doug Potter from Southern uh, Evangelical Seminary has written. He said, we learn best when we put into practice what we are taught by a respected and knowledgeable teacher. The teacher must provide students the opportunity to succeed and the security to fail with apologetics. That's how we learn to cut hair. All with a view of developing a lifelong apologetics learner. That's what happened to me when I learned how to cut hair. I became a lifelong learner about it. One thing I realized, he goes on to say, I really do not know something until I use it repeatedly. The more I use it, the more it becomes a part of me. My students often tell me that the most meaningful thing I did was to force them to use apologetics and then reflect and report on it. And then he goes on to list these psychomotor and domain kind of things that, that he used for them to learn Christian apologetics. This domain can only be effectively integrated into our apologetics training if the facilitator is of a sufficient mastery that he or she can demonstrate that skill before the students. What do we want our graduates of, of our apologetics training to be able to do? That has to be in focus. Do we want them to speak to strangers on the street? Do we want them to be able to have coffee with a skeptical friend? Do we want them to become presenters of Christian apologetics on YouTube, write a blog? Regardless of what the to do that we have in focus, the facilitator who is training the lay apologist must be able to demonstrate the mastery of that skill to the students and help them through the period where they are able now to master the skill, learn, and it becomes uh, just a, a part of habit. But there's still something else missing. <clears throat> And 
I, I, let me share this story from uh, the western region of Ghana. Uh, Nathaniel Donkar was uh, an evangelist that I that I worked with, and he went to a certain village in the western uh, region, and he was uh, open air preaching the gospel in the village, and people were coming and listening. Uh, to his presentation, but as he's preaching, the chief of the village uh, came up and told him to stop preaching, and so he stopped, and the chief said to him, look, you're preaching about a God who can heal and do miracles, and as, the, as he was announcing that, they brought the lifeless body of a woman and just dropped her before him on the ground. And the chief said, <coughs> if your God is real, have him heal this woman, bring her back to life. She died while you were preaching. Now Nathaniel took no notice of the woman, but he zeroed in on the crowd he gave a very concise and well thought out defense of the gospel and of Christianity. When he was done, he turned to somebody and said, uh, go get a pail of water. And so uh, someone went and got a pail of water and brought it. And then he turned to this lifeless body of this woman and began to pray a very simple uh, prayer over her, asking God uh, to do a miracle in terms of raising her up, and then took her by the hand and in a very loud voice commanded her to rise up. And the woman stood right up, alive. And Nathaniel said to the woman, take this pail of water, go back to where you live, and bathe yourself. Now, several things happened right at that moment. One, there was a, a, a positive demonstration of the gospel. Two, he was showing, Nathaniel was demonstrating that this was not, this wasn't something, uh, fake because the woman had been sick for a long time. She didn't have any strength, but now she's standing up fully healed and strong enough to carry a bucket of water back to her home. So out of this emerges what I call actualized apologetics. That happens when you're, we're doing some kind of evangelism activity. And then there is a challenge to the God of the scriptures. That challenge is met with a reasoned and learned defense of the gospel, of the scriptures, and of God. And then the truth of the defense is attested to through a living demonstration of God's presence and power. That's when we know the kingdom of God is not only at hand, but the kingdom of God is there. There are biblical patterns of this, the day of Pentecost, um, and most especially Peter and John, uh, some days after Pentecost, when they, they go to the temple to worship and find a crippled man there, and he's healed. And a big crowd comes around to try and figure out what it's all about. And Peter gives a clear, concise explanation of what happened and an invitation to people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, Saul's, uh, Paul's first missionary journey, uh, they go uh, to the island of uh, Cyprus, and there they're meeting uh, false, uh, they're witnessing to the governor of the island, probably a Roman official, 
and there is a Jewish false prophet whose name is Simon Bar Jesus, and he is interfering with this important discussion and bringing accusation. And Paul uh, has now made his defense of the gospel before the governor now turns to the, the false prophet and says, look, you don't have any part of this. And blindness comes upon that uh, false prophet and the governor of the island uh, believes and becomes a Christian. Acts uh, chapter 19, uh, the disciples at Ephesus. Paul shows up. He notices a small struggling group of disciples. He asks them, what baptism did you receive? They said, we were baptized with John's baptism. And Paul then goes on to help explain and confirm the, the foundation of their faith. And finally, praying over them, there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon those people in Acts chapter 19. And later we see that a huge ministry and, and people coming and, and uh, burning the books of magic and spells and, and the occult material. And if it was uh, priced out at, at today's value, it would be over a million bucks that got burned up. Now that is actualized apologetics. When we're t continuing to talk about biblical patterns, C.H. Dodd, in his work about the apostolic preaching of the gospel, he writes this, We have seen that the apostolic preaching, according to Acts 2, included an appeal to the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in the church as evidenced that the age of fulfillment had dawned and then Jesus Christ was its Lord. This is uh, uh, he takes this from this is that which was spoken by the prophet. That is uh, uh, re referring back uh, to the pa to the prophecy and explaining that now is the fulfillment. The promise, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. <clears throat> and then Peter tells them, he being exalted at the right hand of God and having received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father has poured out that which you are see and hear. And it includes an assurance that those who joined the Christian community received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Con Christian apologetics is nothing less than confronting the dominion of darkness, the powers and principalities, with the manifold wisdom of God. In fact, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, he says uh, that it was given to him to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light everyone the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. He's not talking about... Uh, the, the, the saints and the angels in heaven. He's talking about the dominion of darkness, the powers and principalities that he's referring to. He only uses those terms to refer to the world of darkness, the dominion of darkness. And as we are uh, 
also called in that same way because it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers, to the powers and the principalities in the heavenly places. So we have to ask a question. Do evil, invisible cosmic beings really possess the power to disrupt a plan of God to answer prayer? Can transcendent evil beings negatively affect us in a way that is similar to the way people uh, who have authority over us, earthly princes, affect us? Is it really the case that whether we hear from God might have to do not only with God's will and our faith, as we Western believers customarily assume, but also with the will of, fa of various created invisible beings who exist above us and below God. Now, both Greg Boyd in his book, God at War, and Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, in his idea of the divine council worldview, would answer in the affirmative to most, if not all, of those questions. And Jesus affirms this kind of cosmic civil war ongoing. Matthew chapter 12, verses 28 through 29, they're, <clears throat> they're accusing him uh, and uh, of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. But Jesus tells his disciples, the only way that we can rob the strong man's house is if we first, you, he has to be tied up. He has to be bound up. And that indicates our authority is an authority that will um, mind the powers of darkness uh, in a way uh, that is unusual uh, but effective. We, we are to engage in this kind of pulling down strongholds, ideas that challenge the truth about God. We need to be equipped with spiritual weapons. Anyone's faith who rests on apologetic argument can be persuaded to leave Christ with a different argument. Our faith is meant to rest on God's power. Well, I hope some of the things that I've shared with you today have stimulated your thinking uh, or encouraged you in some way or uh, raised up uh, some kind of uh, defense against what I'm saying doesn't matter to me. Uh, but I thank you uh, for taking time uh, to listen. Thank you.